Graham was reelected in a landslide. So you might say this should have solidified Reconstruction. But in fact, the split in the Republican Party uh, was very ominous for this. And um, uh, it, it, it marked the emergence of a group of reformers. They call themselves the liberal Republicans in 1872. In, 18, in the 1880s, they will call themselves the Mugwumps, a strange name, but it's the same people. They are educated, uh, often college graduates, which is very rare at that time, who think that people like them should be controlling government. And they become an important swing vote between the Democrats and the Republicans. They go back to the Republicans in 1876, but in 1884, they, um, they, they swing over to the Democrats and they help elect uh, Grover Cleveland. As the national politics becomes more and more evenly divided, a swing group like that can have significant, um, significant influence, obviously. Uh, but the main result of the liberal Republican movement is to weaken Northern commitment to Reconstruction in the South to demonstrate that the Northern Republican Party is no longer united and to encourage new anti-Reconstruction violence uh, which will soon emerge in the South. But this is a reflection, it's not just that one group. In the 1870s, for numerous reasons, um, disillusionment with Reconstruction becomes more and more widespread in the North. The racism, which had waned, I think, significantly in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, now becomes more and more prevalent again north, not just in the south, the north as well. The sophisticated southern white propaganda campaign, more and more emphasizing bad government, not just racial I inferiority, uh, he gets more and more sympathetic hearing in, in the north. Uh, the South is groaning under corruption. The natural leaders are excluded from government. Um, federal troops should not really be used to settle local uh, internal disputes. The Klan is exaggerated. It's just a lot of Republican propaganda. It's isolated. Just a couple of young, you know, young uh, uh, bloods riding around, getting a little drunk at night. But it's not really a big deal. We shouldn't worry about it. Peace and prosperity will return to the region once Reconstruction uh, ends. And Northern writers begin to accept and propagandize or spread this uh, vision of the Reconstruction South. One of the most influential, and there's an excerpt in, our, in Janap from him, is James S. Pike. James Shepard Pike, a legitimate Republican, anti-slavery guy, former editor of the, uh, editorial writer in the New York Tribune, went to South Carolina and published his book in 1873, The Prostrate State, the state lying on the ground. You have an excerpt in Janap. South Carolina lies prostrate in the dust, ruled over by a strange conglomerate gathered from the ranks of its own servile population, a society suddenly turned bottom side up the most rude and ignorant democracy that mankind ever saw. It is barbarism overwhelming civilization by physical force. Barbarism, again, that word for the former slaves. Overwhelming civilization. Civilization is the local whites. Barbarism is the local blacks. And in, the, in Harper's Weekly, we get this famous image by Thomas Nast, the great cartoonist for Harper's Weekly. This is Nast in 1865, the cartoon, and not this man. This is Columbia, America, the woman with a black soldier standing there dignified. He's lost his leg. And not this man is about the right to vote. Should not this man have the right to vote? There's your upstanding image of the black soldier as citizen after the Civil War. That's 1865. Then this is Nast. This is the South Carolina legislature. This is the origin of the scene we saw in Birth of a Nation of the South Carolina legislature in operation. This is colored rule in a reconstructed state, Harper's Weekly. Again, here the blacks are, are savages, they're ridiculed, they're just out of, totally out of control, a travesty of democracy, a couple of whites are looking on in disgust. Justice is at the top, uh, looking on in, in, in horror. And this is Reconstruction in South Carolina. So the shift in Nash's, icon, Nash's iconography 
reflects this ideological shift uh, going on uh, in, the, in the North, uh, in, in significant sectors of the North. Meanwhile, um, the Northern business community is uniting behind opposition to Reconstruction. Um, even the more radically inclined insisted, you know, they look to the South as a place to invest, but no one is going to invest in a place where violence is rife, where no one knows what the go what's going to happen to the governments. Only when, and they sympathize with the complaints of the, what, what are called the substantial citizens of the South, that they had been excluded from public office. Um, and they, and in addition, many, many Northerners, the, the election of 1872 shows that you don't need the South to win the presidency. The Republican Party is dominant enough in the North that it can exist without, it can control the national government without the South. Therefore, the stalwart idea that these are important Republican voters doesn't, it begins to lose uh, weight in the, um, in the discussion. Um, the Republican Party is moving slowly toward a new image. It's always going to be the party of Lincoln and emancipation into the 20th century. But increasingly, it's also the party of northern business, of solid, you know, uh, of the high tariff to protect northern business, of sort of stable, solid financial policies. One example of this was in 1874, we'll see in a minute, they... Uh, panic of 1873 and an economic depression begins in 1873 into, 18, into 1877, really. Um, Congress passes what's called the currency bill to inflate the currency, to issue more greenbacks in order to stimulate the economy. This is a classic move. It happens all the time. It's happened recently. Print more money to get the economy going again. Grant vetoes the bill, even though it's passed by a Republican Congress. Why? Because It'll lead to inflation. It'll be bad for business. It's, it's, it's not mainstream, respectable fiscal policy. So that, the, that becomes increasingly a part of the Republican Party self-image. And one other aspect of this, which is very important, is the growing prominence in these years of what we call, it's not really that good a term, but it's evocative, social Darwinism. The application of Darwinian language and thinking to human society. Darwin didn't do that, but, you know, phrases like the survival of the fittest or the struggle for existence, the notion that the structure of, of, of society is based on natural laws, it's based on evolution, it is a natural scientific process, and to try to intervene uh, would, is pointless and counterproductive. To try to help those at the bottom rise would be just as pointless as to try to resurrect a species which had disappeared because it couldn't survive the battle, the struggle for existence. By the way, I notice they're trying to do that now, so they haven't read uh, Darwin lately. Mammoths and stuff, they're trying to with DNA, you know, Jurassic Park kind of thing. The point is, there is a natural order to society. Reconstruction has overturned that natural order. The people at the top deserve to be at the top. The people at the bottom deserve to be at the bottom. That is how society evolves. It's Darwinian. The struggle for existence leads to the survival of the fittest. The people at the top are the fittest. Therefore, they should be in charge of government. And change should be, if it comes, should be slow and evolutionary. It should not be forced by government the way Reconstruction is.